Hi, my name is Toby and I'm known as Toby Sketchloose. I'm an ink and watercolour artist and today I'm going to show you how to sketch a beautiful landscape. And I'm not just going to show you how to sketch one beautiful landscape, I'm going to give you the concepts, the ideas, the principles that you can apply to any beautiful landscape or to any landscape to make it beautiful and to start discovering your art style. The principles behind my art are to keep things loose and fun, to focus more on enjoying the process, and by enjoying the process, I find we almost inevitably produce a little work of art that we are proud of. Similarly, I don't think there's a need to produce things with a diverse, complex, scary amount of supplies or really expensive equipment. No, we can make do with just a few little bits, a couple of colours, and really, as I said, just have fun. As we move through the different lessons, we're gonna look at a five-step process. Now, this five-step process is literally what I use in my professional art career to sketch anything, be that a landscape, an urban landscape, be it floral art, or even doing portraits and sketches of people. I use these five steps. And these five steps are loose guidelines. So as we work through them, I'll explain the importance of each step, but also where you might want to break the rules, where you might want to move in your own direction and have a little bit of fun. My style is, as I might be obvious from my name, Toby Sketchloose, is a sort of loose and expressive style. So here you can see me drawing a lighthouse, leaving big areas white and having fun with the colours in other areas. You can see here another range of things done in this exact same style. This one is more loose and abstract, but we've used the same five steps to really get something fun on the page. Here's a more challenging scene, something with lots of bluebells perhaps in our wood. Again, the same process is all applied. The key is to follow this process so that we are finding our scene, making it easy for ourselves, and then allowing ourselves to react and respond, having a bit of fun, um, and really creating something which isn't just uh, painfully sticking to the reference or scene in front of us, but also allows us to express ourselves on the page as well, and make the most of our limited equipment, whatever that might be. Now, with that in mind, let's have a look at what supplies and equipment I recommend for sketching and painting in this style. So what are we using? Well, let's start with what I've got out here in front of me. I'm actually not going to be using one of these. So we've got a pencil. If you would like to use a pencil, I will not stop you. But I'll talk about why perhaps going straight in with ink might be something which hastens your improvement and gives you a lot of confidence and even adds something extra to your art. Now for me, my main drawing implement will be a fountain pen. This is a fountain pen by Twisby, but broadly speaking, there are lots of very good drawing fountain pens. I prefer an extra fine or a fine nib, but just because I like a fountain pen doesn't mean there aren't lots of very good other options. We could use anything really, as long as it's waterproof, that's the key. So in a lot of pens, you might find fine liners, it will say pigmented ink, or it might say archival ink, or it might just say waterproof. And then you know that pen is good to use. There are fine liners like this. There are different kinds of pens with more sort of uh, few day nibs. These are nibs which are a little bit flexible. Um, all of these different things are fine. Some people even love to use a ballpoint pen or a biro. This is about as cheap as you can get. And the ink in these tends to be waterproof. So you, if you want to use it, absolutely. If you are getting a fountain pen, you will need waterproof ink. There are lots of good options out there. I've got one here by Tom Studio. That's a relatively small maker in the UK, but there are lots of others. And I'll, I'll list the supplies that I'm using in the PDF that you can download as part of this lesson. Next in our processes, we'll need some colours and some brushes. So I just move my pen to one side. We can see I've got my little messy palette here. I've just got 12 colours in here, but we're not even going to use 12 colours. We're just going to use four. We're going to use a primary blue, a primary red, and a primary yellow. That's all you need to create amazing art. And alongside that, I'm going to use something called graphite grey. This is a neutral colour something a little bit grumpy, a little bit earthy, and it just lets us tone down our colours, something we'll discuss a bit later, 
and produce something more dark, more moody than with our bright primary colours. So all you need, all I'm suggesting, is three primary colours and something earthy and dark. Again, the colours I'm using are listed in the PDF you can download. My brushes, I've got a sort of unnamed oriental style brush. This is similar to a size 10 or size 12 round brush. And I've got a flat brush, which is a half inch flat brush. Now these brushes are perfect to go with this size of paper. So this is about a letter or A4 size of watercolour paper. My watercolour paper has a light texture to it. Um, so it's lightly cold pressed. I prefer that to hot pressed paper because it gives your watercolours a little texture. And you can see that, for example, here. Because this paper is lightly textured, our watercolours settle and they leave just some automatic interest, something a little bit more fun. In hot pressed or smooth paper, the colours will slide everywhere. It's a little more difficult to control. And if your paper is not watercolour paper, it tends to be very absorbent, buckle a little bit too easily, and that can really interfere with our processes. So there you go, that is all that you need. A brush or two, a pen, some paper, three to four colours, and the little things that I haven't mentioned yet, a big tub of water, the more the better. Some people even like having two. And you might find it handy just to have a little bit of paper, tissue paper, kitchen roll, that kind of thing, to mop up some water at times or even just using a towel, a microfiber towel is great as well. And from there, we can start moving on and thinking about the actual processes we'll be going through to create our sort of many and varied landscapes in the future. So landscapes for many of us, and this includes myself, can be quite sort of scary, difficult to navigate, or just worrying. When we look at them, we're like, oh, it's so naturally beautiful. How can we possibly start? And we get this kind of white paper fear, something that many of you may be familiar with. This idea that we, <laughs> we have our lovely pristine piece of paper and is our first mark gonna be good enough? Well, I'm gonna give you a nice structured way in this first lesson where we can be confident about applying our first marks. And there's a few key tips that we're gonna cover. And that includes being gentle with your first marks, especially if like me, you're going in with pen first allowing yourself to make mistakes and not panic about it, and seeing things simply. Landscapes are full of big shapes. We just need to let ourselves see them, relax, and pop those on the page and not think too much yet about the details. Now, the first step in creating our art is step one, seeing shapes and drawing those shapes. And you know, if I were to expand that one more stage, I'd call it ink shapes. So in this first step, we are setting the kind of skeleton, the framework for our scene. And we mentioned a few key parts of this that we want to think about. The idea though, the fundamental idea here is that anything can be broken down into shapes from people being a circle, a triangle and a, another triangle. We can then build that up if we want, you know, we can get ever more complicated, adding in more and more shapes. And as you increase the number of shapes that you're drawing, you'll increase the sort of realism of a scene. But don't just think of the success of sketching and drawing in realism. Think about it as effectiveness. So what we're trying to do is produce an effective sketch. So I'm just going to write that here. What do we mean by effective? Well, Normally, in a landscape, we're meaning something which reminds us of the scene, um, hopefully is recognisable, but also is something a bit more than the photo. We have the photo already, and now we're getting our personality on the page. And the start of that is simplifying it and seeing the scene in simple terms. To get started in seeing shapes, it's really important to recognise, as we said, everything can be broken down into shapes. We have our people here. These are simple shapes which we can build on. In an urban scene, you might see a series of sort of rectangles and squares. And on top of them, you might see another sort of set of triangles, parallelograms. Within that, you see a series of rectangles, maybe even circles, maybe other shapes sort of hiding in and around. And instead of trying to draw 
a complicated set of houses and all of these other sort of scary details, we can draw these these shapes. We find our squares, our triangles, our circles. We build them up. And before you know it, what you have in fact got is a little street sketched out. And then our shape-based people can come in, even getting people really close to us by focusing on the proportions of those shapes as well. And we've got a scene building up. And that's all we're trying to achieve with our landscapes. Notice how I've done all these lines quite loose and quite gentle. And the reason that's important is because then we can come back and the ones which are working, we can become a little more certain about later. And that means that when we've made a mistake, so this roof is in the wrong place, it's the wrong shape. Look, I can change that triangle. And those other little lines that we made, they become textures in the background. So we need to keep our initial line work quite gentle, quite fluid, quite loose. And by doing that, we'll be able to build up our scene in stages producing something effective, something interesting, something fun. Now, none of this is a traditional landscape. So let's have a look at a couple of thumbnail examples of more traditional landscapes and simply finding the shapes within those. In the handout, there is a number of reference photos and these are the reference photos that I'm working from in this class. We've got the main one for our overarching kind of project where we're producing a fully finished work of art. And we also have a few where I'll be playing around, having a bit of fun and doing things like these thumbnail sketches along with you. Now, if we take this scene first, this is a rather lovely little village landscape, isn't it? Lots of trees and bushes and also a nice church. Now, if we start with the church, that's nice and easy, isn't it? Like these urban scenes, we can find our simple shapes. And as you do this thumbnail, use this as an opportunity to try just going straight in with ink and seeing what happens. You can find here, you've got a couple of rectangles. You could even break it down into a couple of squares with rectangles below. And if you want, you can even find that there's rectangles below that as well. So we can suddenly start building up a relatively complicated building very easily. On top, we have a triangle. And then we again can find little triangles around that triangle and we're building up the complexity. Alongside we've got kind of a, uh, let's call it a rectangle, but slightly wonky. And I'd encourage you not to try and think too specifically about the exact shapes, but think of it in simple terms. Everything is a square, even if that square has wonky edges. Just say it's a wonky edge square in your head and you'll be able to picture it and translate it onto your page far more easily. We've now built up the sort of important parts of our church. They're the easy shapes because hopefully as humans, we tend to make things in kind of simple shapes. They're all made of square bricks. So eventually it all builds up into big squares and things. But I'd encourage you to be able to see the natural world in these simple shapes as well. Um, so for example, if we move in front of the church, we've basically just got a circle and it's a squashed circle, or you could call it an oval. Next to that, we've kind of got a little rectangle. Next to that, we've got almost a rect, uh, that's a triangle, sorry, not a rectangle. We've got a triangle up here, and then next to that, we've got a, a rectangle, then kind of another triangle. Coming in to the side here, what have we got? We've got a really complicated foreground of leaves, or keep it simple, just a circle which has been cut off at the edges. So we've got this tree coming in over here. And this is our first thumbnail. So what we're trying to do is keep things as simple as possible. The same over here, you could go, you know what, this is not a complicated tree. This is a circle squashed or a, an oval again, if you prefer. And then underneath it or in front of it, you've got this other one sort of crossing across. And you can kind of find if you want, keep going, you find that there's a a rectangle here, that's the fence line. You could find the kind of gate here and all the shapes making up. But the key here is to just be able to start seeing these relatively simple shapes. Now, one thing I've slightly been doing here, but not, not a lot, is A, keeping these lines loose and flowing, but B, adding a little bit of something extra. 
what we don't want to do when we're doing our first shapes is be rigid. So if I'd come in and all my shapes were like bold, hard, literally just geometric shapes, I'm not going to say that's terrible, but it's definitely a different style. It's definitely only ever going to look like that. These are too big, they're too bold, they're too geometric. I'm never going to be able to come on top and sort of correct anything there. I failed in the being loose and light. And so any mistake I make is going to be really difficult. It's also never going to have the right texture. So instead, if we look at this same scene again, what we could do is we can advance on these simple shapes. So now we can find we've got this circle, but really this circle is also made up of all these textures. So we've got these leaf-like textures flowing in and around, kind of breaking up the circle. I'm still drawing a circle though. So I'm still coming around. I'm still thinking about that circle. But now that circle is made up of textures. It's made up of, if you like, very small shapes. We can even bring in some of these little lines, these things which are basically branches. And we can then perhaps start thinking about how to add texture in general to our, our shape. So that might mean expanding these edge textures into the centre. Going back, we can do the same. We've got this kind of overlapping series of shapes and we can find that, you know what, they've all got quite an interesting texture and they're quite different. Some of them are a bit more certain. So these this triangle, which I previously labelled a rectangle, is quite a certain shape. Some of them are a bit spiky. And that's going to contrast actually with the uh, the church, isn't it? Where we've got these shapes and they're relatively strict, but actually the texture itself, the texture of the church is a kind of its own wobbliness, isn't it? Look at the bricks. It's not a new sort of structure at all. It's got definite sort of creaking and crevices, you know, little bits of brick missing here and there. So again, we don't want this strict line we want to be thinking about texture as we build up our thumbnail. Now you'll notice that in both of these thumbnails I've made different mistakes with things like proportion. So here I'm going to lose the top of my tower and that's okay. That's why we warm up with little doodle sketches, little thumbnails like this. It lets us sort of practice. And it doesn't really matter. It shows us when we move on, when we jump into a big sheet of paper with our pen, doing our real shapes, it lets us sort of have made some mistakes, have corrected them, have found them and sort of understand our scene a little bit better. So have a bit of a play with this idea. Try a couple of the other scenes in the handout um, and just see what kind of textures you can create within your shapes and see how much you can simplify a scene and see perhaps that there will be multiple ways to simplify your scene. There isn't going to be one way to do it. There isn't going to be one right way to take something complicated and make it easy. There'll be lots of ways and some of them will call to you and some of them you will not enjoy or you will not like the look of. Have a go, do a few thumbnails and I'll see you in the next lesson. The next part of our process is step two, loose colours loose and flowing colours. Now, the thing with watercolours, the trick to watercolours is water. It's in the name. They're designed to be used with lots of water. The pigments are designed to float and flow. And good watercolour painting is transparent, building up saturation, building up tone, building up contrast, not immediately, but with layers. Unlike acrylic painting, oil painting, or lots of digital painting, where you can work from dark to light because your colours are saturated and opaque with watercolour, we need to do the other way around. So we have to paint the lightest things first. And if we don't keep things light, you can never get that light, that brightness back. If we make things murky and muddy or too structured too quickly, we can never undo that. So it's important that in this this section, <laughs> just when you add your first colours, you use plenty of water, you let things just flow, take off the sort of handbrake a little bit and allow the watercolours to do their thing. And we're going to have a little look now at a couple of ideas which will help with that and also the benefits of doing that.
Now in this first step to get those colors nice and loose and watery, we'll be using a bigger brush. Now I'm using my Chinese style brush and this is, as I said, about a size 10 to 12 round brush. And we'll be using lots of water. And there's two ways to paint in watercolors, essentially two ways to paint. Of course, there's lots of variations on that, but in short, in summary, you can either be painting wet, so the color here is wet, the paper is dry. You can paint wet on dry like this, and that will work, of course, with any color. And what you get then is a neat line. The color stays exactly where you put it. You can layer up to some extent, but in that first layer, you're only ever going to achieve a certain saturation of color. And it's a very nice way to paint. It's very um, friendly. It con feels controllable, but it doesn't always get the best out of your colors. So what I'm doing here is I'm painting first, just to show you my colors, the colors that I'm using today. And you can see they're all lovely flat washes, very easy to do. But to create a more loose and flowing feel to our colors, what I'd encourage you to do is get used to doing some wet on wet. So here I've got a wet brush and hopefully you can just see there in the camera the shine of that water. And now what happens if I drop these same colors in, the colors will paint themselves. So just a little touch of color and you can see it moving all over. If we do the same here with our yellow, we get a different flow of color. If we get, do the same with our red, so remember, I'm just using primary colors, another lovely flow of color. And here we've got far more variation, far more texture. It also encourages us to paint really nice and light, but it's scary, isn't it? It's very scary. And the reason it's scary is because we can't control it as much. But in the first layers of color, I'm gonna suggest that not being able to control it too much is great. It will allow those happy accidents to happen. And if you can let your colors be a little looser, a little bit more flowy, you'll gain a lot from it. So what we've got here is a very simplified version of another of the reference photos, which you can find. Here we've got a sort of distant set of hills and some closer sets of fields with trees in. And I've left out lots of detail because this is a quick thumbnail. It's just trying out our colors. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to apply some water to the sky. And getting used to wet on wet painting is normally most comfortable for people in the sky. So try just doing a really simple thumbnail, getting the water up in that sky, and then dropping some color in and seeing what happens. And your colors will respond a little differently to mine. That's going to depend on lots of things, your brush, your pigment, the exact color and binder used in your brand of colors, the amount of water on your brush or on your page and the kind of paper that you're using as well. But by painting with just that simple little wash of color, look at that amazing sort of unfolding sky we have. I can then come in and just drop a little bit of our sort of moody color in here and maybe be suggesting some clouds. I don't want to do too much to this though. The risk of overdoing it is that things become too complicated and busy. So after you've touched your sky a few times, you just need to let it be, let it sort of flow and do its thing. Now below this, we've got some interesting colors. So with our, uh, with our landscapes, you're obviously gonna have a lot of greens and green is simply made through blue and yellow, of course. And with blue and yellow, even just one blue and yellow like this, even just mixing on the page, we'll be able to achieve a lot of different shades and variations. Touching in a tiny bit of red will bring it towards a more warm color in places. And in places it will make it feel more neutral. Adding a bit more blue will make that green more sort of earthy potentially more punchy. So we can see here we've got a much richer green. And then if we go more towards the yellow end, so more yellow here, we'll end up with a very bright sort of summery or flowery green. And within this, you can see an enormous variation. This is where our grumpy sort of neutral color comes in, because as soon as we then add that, we can add areas of increasing tone and depth. 
And all I'm going to do is essentially get a little bit of my yellow, a little bit of my blue. I've got a very messy palette at the moment. I'll be cleaning that out before I start painting my final project. But we get a little bit of that mixed yellow and uh, blue, get a nice green, and then I'm just going to see what happens. I'm not going to worry about the sky mixing in because this is painting the lightest colours. So as we come down, I want these colours, most of them we're going to cover up later in our future stages, but I want to find those lightest yellows, those brightest greens, those most fun bits of colour and really make sure I've got those in my scene. Towards the front there's a lot of shadow, so I'll bring in a bit more blue and even a little bit of that grey, but I don't want to overdo things here. I don't want to overdo things, I don't want to overpaint, and fundamentally I want to leave it looking something like this. A sort of wishy-washy, <laughs> splishy-splashy array of colours. We might touch a little bit of more yellow here, we might do a little bit more grey here, but fundamentally we're after this kind of aesthetic. And notice I've left lots of white. Now this is a personal thing, it's part of my own sort of personal uh, enjoyment, let's say. It's my, my preference. I like paintings have a lot of negative space. These bold areas of white provide a contrast, a bit of fun. And I'd encourage you to play with that idea. You don't have to. You can see here this little painting here, which I've got an example. I've left very little white. But still, hopefully you can see what we've done here is we've painted these lightest bits, which are just sort of peeking through. And what we're going to do later is bring in these darker colours, these darker colours on top. Don't overdo it here. And the biggest thing to try and avoid doing is coming in with really fit paint and painting these really bold and challenging colours. So if I was to come in really thick, you kind of end up with all this texture, all these busy edges. Do you see how this has got an edge we can draw around? Here we've just got soft blending of colours. And too much of that too soon, and it becomes very difficult to sort of rescue anything. Make it too structured and too complex and too saturated too early. And we've also lost all the opportunity to have that light shining through. So that's what we're trying to achieve with this step. Have a go, do a few thumbnails, keep it really loose and light. You might want to watch the next step as well, so that you have a little bit of faith that actually <laughs> this madness, this looseness is going to produce something a little bit interesting with a little bit of patience. So next up, we're gonna to have to let that dry. It doesn't need to be totally 100% dry, but we want it to be mostly dry. Now the magic of watercolours is that when they're dry, they're actually waterproof. You can scrub them up again if you try really hard, but if you just wash over in a normal painting stroke, watercolours, when dry, are effectively waterproof. What that means is that we can come on top of them with another layer of watercolour, and make things bolder and more interesting. We can add the structure that that really loose wash didn't have and bring out those highlights. Now we can also always see through watercolours. They're transparent. We mentioned that at the beginning. Unlike acrylics and oil painting, unlike ink even, watercolour is transparent. So that means that when we are adding colours on top, we're getting a little bit of mixing of the light coming through those layers. It means every layer will be darker than the one before because you're mixing two layers of intensity together. And that is another reason why we always have to paint from light to dark. And this time, in this step, we need to take care to leave the light, to not cover up our all of our previous layer, cover up some of it, enough to get some structure and the important parts of our scene, but leave enough light shining through that we still have a beautiful sense of light in the rest of our image. The darkness against that of our layers and of our ink is what provides contrast. The dark against the light is what brings your image to life. And if you only have light, if you only have dark, it will always look a little bit flat. And that is why this stage is so important.
and we are back and you can see our piece of paper is mostly now dry. What we're going to do is be using a smaller brush. So if we compare these two brushes, you can see not only is it obviously shorter, but it's got a lot sort of smaller belly and the belly of the brush is where all the water is held. So with this brush, even if I dip it in water, pop it in our paint and paint the same way, we're going to do a much drier line. You can see that extended almost nowhere. And that means when we get lots of pigment on the brush, the pigment to water ratio is going to be much higher. We end up with a much darker line, a naturally much bolder line. And that's going to be the same for all of our colours. So we end up with these bolder touches we're making because our brush is smaller. And that's where actually having a couple of different sizes of brush is quite important and just makes life a lot easier as well. Now we mentioned that these colours are always see-through. We can see here that these colours have got a sort of transparent feel. You can see that by painting them wet on wet, look at these amazing textures that we've got as well. And you can see all of the above here with lots of softness. So what we're now going to be doing is actually coming in with a more controlled approach. So we're going to be using strokes more like this on top of these looser approaches. And look what happens when I do that. We get this kind of darker effect. Now, because the page isn't totally dry here, you can see it's kind of softened. And that's quite a nice effect. Um, and it kind of means our colours aren't overly busy and overly sort of challenging. I must say I wasn't expecting that to be wet. It's still, to me, I thought it was dry. But like I said, we don't have to wait for our page to be totally dry, just dry enough that we can control things. Now I'm confident that these two colours will be dry and we'll get a different effect. So there you can see dramatically how different these lines are. Now this is useful as a comparison because for me that's too neat and what I will do in this stage is come in with a clean brush and just feather along that edge and do you see how that kind of softens it that just makes it less definite doesn't have as sharp an edge and that prevents things being too busy that is a way of kind of emulating this slightly wet on wet approach this was probably a bit too wet there wasn't enough control there but here I can pop on a little bit of my red, very controlled, and then I can come in with a cleaner brush, feather that edge, and we end up with this kind of control meets loose approach. And this is going to be a very personal thing where your sort of barometer lies for how loose you want things to be. The other thing that's important in this step is, as we said, these colours are see-through. So if I paint all the way across, you'll see we get these red still coming through. Here it looks like a more intense yellow and here we get a subtle greeny tinge. We can do the same if I come over here where the colours are all dry with the blue we'll get green, sort of warmish purple and just more intense blue. Painting on top of the shadow with any of these colours will just give us a darker colour. So we've got a, a darker red in the middle of this line of red. And if we go Back to this side, I'll use my red going across from right to left. What we'll get is changing intensities, then we'll get a softer mixing, and then here it's going to be too wet and everything will just sort of blend and fuzz and just be a bit untidy. So we're trying to get this balance right in this stage between being really certain, having a bit of control and feathering our edges, and it's called softening your edges is the sort of technical term for doing this versus too wet and do you see how this has kind of just become a bit muddy and this is a challenge which persists for, for everyone getting that balance right it's well worth having a bit of fun with experimenting with trying a little thumbnail so that you start to understand how to start layering colors and how wet or dry you want the page when you do that layering but hopefully you can see the various possibilities of mixing feathering layering and how this second layer interacts potentially with that first one. With all of that in mind, let's just see what happens if we start applying this approach here.
Now, one rule I almost always stick with is don't touch the sky. The sky has done whatever it wanted to do. It looks interesting, but if we touch it, we'll get all these lines in the sky. Broadly speaking, skies, they can have lines, they have clouds and things, but broadly speaking, they don't have dark lines, which we would be creating with our colors and it feels unnatural to me. So it's not something I ever do. That's not to say people don't do it, and it's not to say people don't do it well. But for me, a rule in this style of painting is avoid the sky. And then I'm gonna work from back to front, finding little bits of color to add in in different layers. So the distant hills are a bit darker, they seem kind of blue. So I'm adding in initially just some blue. Coming forward, we got a more convincingly green hill. So I'm gonna come and add in a sort of layer of green on top of that and perhaps be a little neater painting around things. Now bear in mind this brush I've selected to paint this whole page so if you've got this size of brush and you're struggling on this thumbnail well that's to be expected because this brush is probably a bit too big to be sketching something like this but it's good to get used to the size of brush we're going to be using in a second. Here I've layered up a dark colour and a dark colour. Now I'm going to layer up some of my yellow and you'll see that the same thing happens. This yellow appears darker having been layered up. And I could approximate that this whole field is essentially yellow and just wash over the whole thing like that. That's one option. Another option is to start being a little varied. So doing some of this mixing on the page, bringing in some greens, some blues. And we haven't used the red much and there are ready browns in there so we can start to use our little artist impression at this stage to be bringing in those more interesting tones and notice how just popping in those little bits of red doesn't look unnatural even if i go a bit bolder it's starting to look like an artistic choice we've got this kind of red layer this line coming through this is where we are literally making artistic decisions about how to make our painting a little bit more interesting I'm going to do something similar probably um, for these trees at the front. At the moment they're a little bit flat aren't they? They're a bit boring. And one thing that we can do with this layer of painting is introduce shadows. And shadows are just darker areas and by layering up we produce darker areas. So what I'm going to do is layer in a little bit of green in here, covering up a bit of that negative space but leaving some of it. So we've still got that light shining through. And the same here, I want some of these light areas shining through. And I did mention it's really important. We might cover most of the first layer. I've probably covered a little bit too much here, demonstrating the, the mixing on the page, but we definitely want to leave some of it shining through. And then in the very foreground, what have we got? We've got a very sort of the deepest shadows, haven't we? So here I might mix that gray in with the green, my graphite gray, this color here and then just let it blend together so that that shadow enters these trees in the foreground as well. And that way we're going to get this soft blending of shadows going up. We could even start popping a little bit of that shadow colour in other trees in the distance, even if we wanted gently in the very distance. As long as things are still wet, then it's okay to still poke and play around. You can be quite free with how you're doing things. And like that, we pretty successfully layered our image. This is our bold colours, more specifically popped onto our loose colours. We might want to feather some of these edges. Again, how much you want to do that is going to depend on how neat a painter you are and what your personal stylistic preferences are. For me, I tend to do a lot of this feathering. And then we need to let it dry again. And you can see, hopefully, the similar ideas again, using just this simple example, how we've now got these areas of our light coming through. We've got these darker areas. And then in the next stage, when this is totally dry this time, none of this not quite waiting because I'm not patient enough. It's got to be totally dry. We're going to come back and we're going to restructure. We're going to do that with our ink, whatever pen you've been using. And this will add real darkness, real contrast before we come in with some final touches at the very end. You'll see what I mean when we come, but this is where we really bring in that emphasis and we make this scene start to look finished instead of looking 
loose and flowing, it will suddenly become a real scene. In the meantime, you might want to try doing a few more thumbnails, perhaps finishing off those churches we worked on at the very beginning of this whole course. See what you can do. Try different ways of painting different colours and see that different ways of doing this will work just as well with more interesting results. So time to grab our pen and do a little bit more ink work. There are a couple of important things to recognise here. Whenever you pop ink on top of watercolour, from things like fine liners or fountain pens, that, that ink line will look a lot bolder. So we need to be delicate and gentle with how we're applying that line. I call this step restructuring because what we're doing is we're taking those flowing colours and we're taking those, remember we said loose and delicate shapes from the beginning, and we're finding the ones which have worked. Where there are watercolour edges, we might choose to draw around those watercolours and make that a new shape. Where the watercolours have flowed together, we might choose to find ink lines all on their own to imply different shapes, be it two different trees next to each other, or even splitting apart different buildings from the background. The other thing that we need to be careful of is not overdoing it. We might add a few textures here, we might add bits and pieces, but we can never, just like with watercolours, we can never take this ink away. So being careful to work mostly on bits which are necessary and not overdoing it, not adding too much ink, not adding too much craziness to our page that we sort of then regret. We can always add more later. We can never, as I said, never take it back. And we're back again. And this time we really are dry everywhere. And the thing we're trying to achieve is enough extra structure, but not too much. So for example, if we just take our silly examples up here, these little lines we painted over lines, what we might choose to do is find these watercolour edges and amongst these edges even here, that might give us the structure perhaps that we wanted for a block of flats. I'm stretching the limits of imagination here, of course, but this is a really simple idea. Here, this might even be a little tree. And this time, instead of just finding the edges of that line, we've also kind of expanded and just moved the edge of what was otherwise a little block. Similarly here, this could be one tree in the sort of background and another tree overlapping it in the foreground. And by just finding these simple sort of shapes within shapes, we can suddenly add that structure and pull apart all this looseness. Now that might be a little bit too sort of theoretical, and maybe I'm just imagining things in my own head. So let's turn to our real example here and start finding those shapes again, because that's really what this is about. It's just about finding those shapes. There's a couple of key principles there as well. As we paint, as I said, as we draw on top of our paint rather, the line is bolder. You can see how this line is naturally bolder. And now what's happened, because the lines in the distance are so much bolder than the ones in the foreground, the distance feels like it's come forward. It doesn't make sense anymore. So we need to be careful of that effect. And we need, therefore, to make sure that our boldest lines, the most ink and the biggest contrasts, are, in fact, in the foreground, not in the distance. So if our distant lines look like they do here, then we can add in a few extra shapes, we can chain things around a little bit. But if our distant lines now look like this, what we need to do with our foreground lines is make those bolder. Now that might literally be by pressing harder. That will work for a fountain pen. It might be by using a bolder fine liner, a sort of bigger diameter fine liner. Or, there are other things we can do to increase the boldness of these lines. For example, we can start adding a little more ink. Simple hatching here. That's adding more ink. It's making the ink stand forward at the very front. You see how our funny little abstract hedges suddenly sort of come a bit forward. Instead of simple hatching, we might choose on a bigger piece of art to apply little textures. So we could build up a tree through lots of little textural marks, for example. Now applying it just here, 
that might look something like this just simple simple little textural marks Appl applying a sort of more detail oriented approach to the front and therefore showing that it's in the front we can also apply a little hatching to the shadows in the uh, foreground and um, we might even find as we said new lines new shapes this is about finding structure within our very loose approach and now we're still paying attention to our reference but we're also very much paying attention to this scene that is in front of us and hopefully you can see even with these very small extra marks that we've made here suddenly this actually rather works it's very simple but it's got depth it's got shape it reminds us of the scene that we're sketching these last couple of lessons it really actually does work so hopefully that gives you a little bit of faith that with just a few extra marks a bit of extra structure yours also will work and there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't so have a go with these ideas apply them to the little doodle sketches that you've done maybe even try a fun little exercise so where you make a splash like this and to give yourself some confidence in finding edges what could this splash become so here we could just find the edges and then start doodling in the center and come up with whatever kind of crazy contraption we find within this so maybe this is a kind of uh sort of that kind of steampunk era <laughs> postmodernist uh, block of flats look we've got this kind of window here we've got this this shape coming round maybe all of these are doorways and we can hatch them in you know really silly ideas but you can suddenly start finding these different shapes i'm sure many of you would have also been able to find within this remarkable splash something like an animal um, it's just simple ways to really stretch your imagination and see what you can find amongst the chaos and looseness of these splishy splashy watercolors and then create something from that create something interesting from that with depth that reminds you of the scene that we sort of built up from in the first place and there we go there's a couple of people sitting up there in their postmodernist steampunk era uh, block of flats really silly exercise really silly but also kind of mindful and refreshing and something a bit different i'd i'd sort of implore you to have fun with your painting your sketching and doing silly things like this is one of those very freeing ways that you can do that we're on to the fifth step and i've just been waffling on about how finished it looks and it is it could be finished at this point but there's always the option to keep building and me introducing a fifth step to my process kind of frees up my mind it gives me the license to do a little bit extra this might be ink this might be watercolor this might be a bit of mixed media adding some posca pen marks acrylic marks on top adding gouache adding pencils or watercolor pencils the world really is your oyster i'm going to stick with our watercolors and our ink and i'm going to just do a few tiny touches and little ideas to show you the kinds of things you might do in your finishing touches but be brave be experimental let your heart race as you risk ruining your sketch or your painting that's fine only by making mistakes do we work out yeah we could probably do it differently next time and in the end that's how we get better and better and how we work out what we enjoy and what we enjoy looking at at the end as well so we're back here and we're on to our final touches now the final touches could be ink or watercolor or anything else as i just said and if we were to do more ink that might be finding little extra details it might be for example popping some little sheep in the background of this scene in this very small thumbnail i think any more ink and we're going to overdo things it might be you know that we would include doing all these little leaf textures as another part of final steps so there's lots of possibilities and it's going to be very scene dependent the thing i'd like to focus on are the possibilities with color so here you might even choose to use a very small brush 
and we're going to be breaking some of the rules I mentioned before about you always using loads of water. Now, perhaps what we want to achieve is a really thick, busy kind of paint. Now this, you can see it's almost like honey or toothpaste consistency. Not good to paint with at all. If we paint big areas, it just, it looks horrible. But if we use it judiciously, if we use it in small amounts, it can produce lovely little punches and highlights. So here, I've got a dark green and I can use it to just create little highlights, little almost opaque highlights. Not good for watercolour to have lots of opaqueness, but okay to have certainly a little bit. Now that can be with really dark colours. So I could use these sort of graphite grey and almost make it a black and produce a kind of silhouette line amongst some of these little trees in the distance. But it can even be with really bold and bright colours. So I could take my yellow and pop in bright yellows in the foreground. Now, this is useful to see, because do you see the problem here with this really thick paint and doing too much of it now? Do you see how this ink behind that paint is now sort of dulled down? We're losing something by overpainting too much. So it's important when we're doing these little fun touches, little pops of blue in different places, little pops of red or green or yellow or whatever it is we're touching in, that we don't do too much. Because if we do too much, we'll start to make things cloudy and muddy and busy. And you know what? It's better to take a step away and maybe do that step tomorrow. Maybe add a little bit more tomorrow if it still needs it. Now, another lovely thing that I always love doing in this part of my step, and this is, as we say in the UK, a Marmite thing. You either love it or you hate it. And I like adding little splashes. So literally, for me, the best way to splash, hold my brush, like so, just in one hand, and tap. And you can see that produces reliable little splashes. The bigger the brush, the more water, the bigger the splashes. The closer I hold it to the paper, the tighter the splashes, the further away, and they'll go absolutely everywhere, including all over my camera and everything else. So it's about practice. It's not something that's easily taught. We can show you how to do it but you'll find your way, whether it's tapping the brush like this, whether it's doing it my way, whether it's using another brush and you can tap them one on top of the other. But whatever you choose to do, you can use these splashes in the sky, in the foreground. Obviously I've gone a bit mad here and done too many, but that's okay because using plenty of water always keeps us flexible and I can soften these out. I can lift them up with my paper, soften them and lift even more. So don't worry too much if they go a bit wrong, you know, use it as a kind of lesson learnt for next time, but also recognise if it does go a little bit wrong, you can always lift them out a bit. One last thing I might do here, and this is a personal thing again, this is where you can apply a lot of your personal ideas. For me, I like having a little punch of red in my paintings. It feels warm and happy. And so I might just find a couple of places which are not real, but where I can add my own little punch of red. And I, I do this in a way which is balanced across the image, so it's not all in one place, even with a few little gentle splashes. And you can see with much drier paint, these splashes are much smaller. And again, this is this final steps part is where you might apply your own little bit of silliness. And if I wanted to do something in my, I kept calling it a postmodernist, block of flats, we could apply the same ideas and, and practice how these final touches in this even might just introduce some new little bit of fun into our previous little study of trying to find structure and, and whatnot in a loose watercolour wash. So there you go, really simple ideas, applying those final touches, little bits of fun into your image, not absolutely necessary, the felt finished before, but hopefully now you can feel it even more finished, even more fun, little punches of colour, and hopefully not overdone. And like that, we're ready to start a bigger painting. Do take your time, do more thumbnails, use some more of the references I've provided in the downloadable PDF, but also use your own scenes. You can use these same techniques on 
anything. It's literally, if we were doing flowers, if we were doing urban scenes, if we were doing people, I'd be telling you to do the same things. It just happens we're doing landscapes today. So have a bit of fun, get your shapes, your loose and bold colours, bit of structure and those finishing touches, have a play and give yourself a bit of confidence, allow yourself to make mistakes and I'll see you in the next lesson where we will be starting to sort of paint for real, to produce our finished scene. And now that we are feeling really comfortable, really great about our five step process, it's time to put that process to the test, to do it on a bigger scale. And that will bring a few small differences to how we approach things, but just small differences, more opportunities to change things very slightly um, and make them more fun and make them more personal and about you and your experience. So we have our scene, again this is in the downloadable handout, and we have our step one and we're going to be applying our shapes onto the page. Now what we can see first, the obvious things, and I always start with the obvious things. The obvious things are these trees here. And there's a big tree here. So let's pop this tree shape in. Now I'm gonna move it down the page a little bit so that we have less of this foreground in. But the foreground is gonna be interesting to deal with as well. And these shapes, they're basically triangles, aren't they? So I'm gonna draw a triangle. It's a triangle with that texture. And I'm being really quite loose and gentle, I hope, with my lines so that if it goes a bit wrong, let's say I do something silly like that, it's going to disappear later when we add even more texture and more fun to our sketch and when we come back and restructure as well. And we can find the sort of base of that tree. I'm not going to finalise the base and you'll see why later. It's important when objects meet the ground that we sort of leave that meeting point as a gentle, well, a void really, a little space so that we can come back and edit it. We can then move on to these other trees here. You notice how this is a triangle. These are slightly more spherical, but still basically triangles. They are a different kind of tree. And I'm gonna try and get that different texture and the different shape, just so that we can see that. We can see that they are different. And this is what we're talking about when we say the essence of the scene. We're not trying to be exact. We're trying to show people what's going on, but not everything. You know, there has to be something left to the imagination, something for the viewer to decide about. Otherwise, you know, it's just the photo. It's not art. It doesn't matter. That's not fair. It can still be art, of course. But I'm just trying to say there's also a wonderful way of not saying everything, not doing everything. You shouldn't worry if you haven't made it perfect. For example here, I don't think I'm going to add that final tree and I don't think that final tree would add much to my scene and therefore I don't have to add it in. It's not perfect, it's not the exact scene and that is also absolutely okay. In the distance we could find some of these sort of human shapes, can't we? These there's a little sort of a square with a triangle on top. That's this little hut on one side. Again, I've got a bit wrong here where I drew the line, but because I kept it light and loose, that will fade into the distance later. There's another one here. It's difficult to see. I might actually just leave that one out. Then we've got the big shape of the scene here. We've got this kind of oval, big semicircle, and I'm just going to get that in. And the texture of this, which is, of course, the rolling hills. It's very smooth, it's very different to these trees. And we'll get that in and just let that flow across the scene. And within that, we've then got other little, well, trees. And to show their trees, I want to keep the texture about the same. So we've got the idea of this texture here, but the scale has to be smaller. And I'm trying to, Think of these as shapes, basically circles and uh, triangles and simple shapes. Nothing too clever. Not trying to be suddenly drawing every leaf. It's tempting and our brain wants us to go, oh, 
it's a tree, it's got leaves, we'll draw every leaf, but we can't see the leaves really individually. There we go, so here's the last one of the trees I'm going to add in, at least for now. We've then got the shapes of some of these fields, and this is quite nice to find because these shapes will help us consider where our colours are going to go, where the greens go, where the oranges go. And it also starts to show a bit of the perspective of the scene. We could start adding in some of the just simple textual lines as well. There's these lines running through the fields we can add in here. And then the last shape is this kind of, it's a, if we think of the, the foreground as a whole area, we've got this rectangle which we've left blank here. And within that rectangle we've got these funny other shapes, all these flowers and leaves and um, I don't even know what these are called. Are they ears of ears coming up? I'm not sure. But again, don't need to know what they are. Don't need to be able to name them to see the shapes and to sort of create our version of the shapes. And have a look at these shapes and which ways they're pointing and decide how many you personally want to add in. And as you're adding them, think of the texture, the direction, think of how they're layered and just get that idea in. And I'm just trying to bring in this concept of this rectangle of these textures with a few bits breaking out above that rectangle. And as we just build that up, don't want to overdo it. We can do more later. I'll probably leave it there. And then just to help with this feeling of the rectangle, I'll draw these little textural lines coming across. And is there anything else we can add in? Well, yes, now we can find there's a little sort of fence going across. That's helping with our rectangle shape as well. There's a little fence coming across here as well. And that helps us with the scale. It helps send this scene kind of backwards. And look, it helps finish off the bottom of that tree. Here we can see not a fence, but instead we can see sort of little bits of grass. They come in, there's a few little bushes and things. And that helps us finish off the bottom of these trees. And if we just add little bits of texture as well, we can finish off our little hut. And that is step one, our shape's done. Now, something we couldn't do in our last scene, because it was so small, is we couldn't advance our shapes and find the shapes within shapes so much. And here, well, we can start, for example, with our trees. We, we did a few little textural marks, but here we can do, you know, more textural marks if we want. So we can come in and we can find there's little dark areas. These are the kind of shadows in the tree. And instead of hatching them, so we could do simple lines to hatch, but what we can also do is show all these textures going on in this tree. We can build up the kind of textures between the trees that separates them out. We've got this contrast of light and dark. And just these simple extra touches might be the kind of things you can experiment with, have a play with and see, you know, just what works. Don't overdo it. So we're just going to keep this nice and simple. We're not going to take more than a couple of minutes of adding these things in. Maybe in the front, just simple like suggestions of a few more of these shapes, but much looser and lighter, more sort of suggesting these fronds of grass than anything else. And in the background, we might just want to add in more flowing lines, lines which are showing the direction of the sort of mowing of this grass, for example. But again, nothing too complicated. We can always, always add more when we come back, but we can never, <laughs> ever take away the ink that's on our page. So I'm going to leave it there. And we're going to move on in the next video to step two, our loose colours. Now, having done the ink, popped our pen to one side, we can do our loose colours. This needs our bigger brush. And often as well, something I didn't cover in the intro, I like to hold my little pad at a slight angle. That might just be a couple of centimetres up at a sort of tender angle. Or sometimes you might want a really steep angle. For me, I'm just popping my palm under and that's going to let me tilt and angle my um, my paper. And that helps a bit with how you get the colours to flow. We talked about splashing at the, at the end as well. And I quite like splashing at the beginning. 
we talked about wet on wet and what we can do is we can almost do a, a wet on wet approach but where we start with splashes we then add water so we get this really soft look at that soft and lovely spread of color i can then tilt my page or let it flop down depending on how i want the water to flow and having done that i can move things around a little bit more water letting things sort of settle and flow can touch a bit more pigment in here and look let that pigment paint itself do you see we just touch it in and it will spread out and do its own thing now we come down don't we? we've got these lovely yellowy oranges so this is probably an opportunity where we can get lots of our nice yellow whatever primary yellow you have and a tiny bit of red just a tiny bit of red because red's such a powerful color compared to our yellows and then we'll end up with a, a slightly warm wash it's not really warm in terms of the colour. Um, and we can now, keeping our paper angled, we can just bring that colour into those distant hills. And that's going to, yes, allow some of that blue to come in. That blue will help turn this orangey yellow into a little bit of uh, green. And that's great. And it will also come and create some shadows. Do you see how we've got this kind of shadow naturally forming? From how that blue has melded in so we're allowing the colors to do a bit of their own thing we're keeping it loose everything's flowing and i know this is takes a bit of bravery to do it like this but by doing it like this you'll also get some amazing effects which you can't control really you can't dream them up they just happen when we let the colors sort of play with themselves and do their own little thing a bit more yellow just to touch in here, bring out a little bit more brightness. And then we can move down into this very front area. And here I think we'll stick with really light wash. There's a lot going on potentially. So I'm gonna just try and get a little bit of a very greeny color. Less of that orange, more of that green. And link all of this area up. And notice how I've left our trees white here i've sort of painted relatively neatly around them and i haven't included them in this wash and i talked about leaving space leaving negative space not painting every every bit and that can extend to not painting really key elements so in this i'm going to show you that i can not paint these trees at the beginning and maybe we'll paint them later we'll paint some of these trees certainly these distant trees but having your um, main elements negative space can actually be a really lovely way to paint or not paint as it were. But we'll see, we'll see as we develop whether you think that's a good idea or a bad idea. And do feel free to make up your own mind and you know, your style has got to be your style. It's not just what some crazy man on the, uh, <laughs> on the app says to do or on a video or on YouTube says to do. It's got to be something you believe in. There we go, really soft wash of colours coming all the way down. I'm going to put my page down now and just do a couple of tiny touches. Do we see there's lots of oranges and reds running through here? Well, if we get those in to start with, and this is where we're only using three colours, so we're not going to get these exact pinks and oranges in. Instead, we're going to approximate them. So I'm going to use my red to create these ideas of pink and red rather than trying to be really clever and pick out the exact right colors this is about creating an idea of the scene not creating the, the sort of perfect exact scene we see in front of us so we can see a bit of orange that's yellow and red mixed and a bit of my pure red and we get these kind of warmer colors in the foreground just let them blend and merge as well now if we wanted to be clever something else we can do take our smaller brush and just lift out a few areas so we can make space for these highlights in the flowers for example so we can come in do you see how i'm able to because i'm painting really wet and loose so this is another advantage of painting really wet wet on wet like we talked about before and painting loose is we can come in with a clean brush what i'm doing is i'm just drying the brush off on a tissue at the side and we can lift out the pigment from within those flowers and so that's going to give us this pinky orangey 
background, areas of lighter white, but we didn't have to spend ages painting around every flower. And what we also aren't left with is a really busy image with lots of lines. We're just left with these soft, light areas, which we can have a bit of fun with when we come to our bold colours and have a bit of fun with when we come to our final touches and add even more colour in. And like that, my initial madness is pretty much done. There's always little touches you think you can make and sometimes they're a good idea, sometimes they're not. Here I'm just going to add a tiny bit more yellow into this distance to make it feel different from here. And then I'm going to stop. And this madness will dry, it will do its thing, and we'll come back and we will make something magic from it. Whatever has happened, because watercolours will always do their own thing, whatever has happened, we will make something out of and it will look fantastic. You just have to have a little bit of faith, a little bit of understanding that in any painting, and especially in watercolours, you're working through a process from start to finish. So let's let this one dry off and see what happens. And we are back and we are pretty much drying. There's a couple of wet patches and that's fine. That means that some of our colours will be a little soft. I don't want things completely dry because then we get all of those hard, definite edges, which isn't what I want yet. Or at least I want some, but I don't want everywhere to be busy and overly dry. What I find amazing and is always worth remembering is, do you remember that busy madness we had before? And now that it's dried, it looks soft, it looks manageable. And that is always worth remembering, especially with watercolours, that when it will, when it's dried, it will look very different. It will look more gentle. Watercolours dry and become more transparent and less bold. So we can now move on to our bold colours. And what we're going to do is work, as we said before, from front to back. So I'm going to get some nice rich orange and I'm using my smaller brush and getting richer paint this time. And this time we are going to pay a bit of attention. Remember in the warm up I said I, I probably painted a bit too much. I didn't leave enough of the light coming through. But we'll pay attention to that this time. And we're going to just bring in these lovely oranges and see how the orange has a bit of a texture. It's sort of floating across the page. Now, I was initially going to paint around these trees, but it's a bit fiddly and there's also not much actual needs to paint around these trees because they're so dark that any watercolour we pop on top will be a dark green or even a dark shadow colour and will cover up you know this relatively light orange. So I'm not going to focus too much on painting around them instead I'm just going to go for it and have a bit of fun and then on top we'll remember to create a bit of shadow. We've got this really rich, luscious green, haven't we, in the front. So I'm going to make something of that. And that, again, this thicker paint, this bigger area we're painting, we can really make something of these interesting colours as they come around. Here it's easy to paint around this tree, so I will paint around that one. Then as we go back into the distance, we don't just have this orange, we also have some greens in there. And this is where I can actually use this green to come and soften some of these edges I've left. And then the same green can come in underneath these trees. And now we have this kind of varied wash filling the background of our image and just really hopefully bringing things together and making things work in a more sort of harmonious way. In the foreground, let's make things really rich. So we're going to have big, sweeping, bold marks. And what I'm going to do is start by popping in lots of these vertical marks. And this is a bit of uh, bravery by me. I don't know that this is 100% going to work, but I know that I want to do something quick and spontaneous. And this is my best bet, just being a bit, a bit brave. So pop in these vertical marks, and this is where I can really just let things soften out. So I'm coming back in with my clean brush, lots of water, and kind of feathering at the edges again, as we talked about before. And this is introducing, hopefully, some of these sort of linear textures coming up into potential flowers and ears and whatever we're calling them. 
and there we go that's probably enough isn't it probably enough of these things jumping up and then on top of that let's get this nice sort of orange deep orange this time isn't it so a bit more uh, red than in this and we'll just start getting these sort of flower shapes and just bringing them up like so little sort of shapes poking up some of them are going to be more pink so we'll remember to leave a few sort of areas light for that and you see how this is blending and mixing absolutely okay with that happening in fact i'm delighted that's happening it's intentional to allow these colors to still be soft in places now let's get a bit of watery red to get some of these sort of more pink flowers in these these ones which are right at the foreground just a little bit more sort of light suggestion of pinky reds again we're not not going to perfectly color match them because we're only using three colors and that just doesn't give you the versatility to paint with a sort of photorealistic hat on but that doesn't mean we can't get a jolly good sort of representation of those same things on our page and you see how already things are drying and desaturating and softening and we can therefore move on back up to the top and see if there's anything extra we want to do which of course there is so i'm going to get my rich green i'm going to add to that a little bit of gray and then these trees can suddenly come to life as a sort of real object in the distance if we don't paint over the entirety of them if we leave little gaps we'll be able to treat them as a little bit of light as well there is light and dark on these trees after all and i'm just using the corner of the brush at times at other times i'm using the flat of the brush to create big marks and then going to use this same color to come in underneath whilst things are still nice and wet and look, we've got this all this sort of shadow being cast underneath these various tree trunks coming across like so all under here as well we've got deep shadows and then we can use this same gray to increase the busyness that we've got going on at the front here the little touches of greeny gray just all sort of building up to something building up with those bolder more interesting more vibrant colors now something you might notice is it's a lot busier over here than over here and that is intentional we want our focal area to be focused to one side typically we have this idea of a rule of thirds so you divide your page up into a line here a line here that's one two and three and then two vertical lines here one two and three and then where those lines intersect you get your focal point so for example here these lines are all intersecting and we've got the most going on both with these trees and with these sort of loose attempts at flowers so having realized that's what we're doing we'll keep this quieter more suggestive and we will keep working in over here we'll keep working in a little bit more busyness a little bit more chaos a little bit more fun we can enrich the colors on this side a little bit more as well so these flowers before even we get to the kind of final touches we can discover that we want a little more richness in these reds and the more richness in these oranges and that is all increasing the contrast we've got darker colors and bright white space so hopefully these concepts and ideas are making sense and you can start imagining not just in this scene but in any landscape how you can start applying these ideas to your own scenes as well and like that our bold colors are done and it's looking a little less chaotic there's a bit more structure and hopefully again you've got an idea now looking at this and looking at your own what we might do when we come back in and we restructure and we're back and we are pretty much completely dry there's always going to be little patches of water in places when you paint really wet unless you wait for a very long time um, 
but it's important just to be aware of those and avoid them as best you can with your ink. What we're doing now, of course, is restructuring. So I'm going to start at the back because I don't want the back to get too bold. So I'll be really gentle and just refine that line. You see how the sky and the colours in the fields have blended a bit? Well, this gives us the opportunity just to redefine where the sky is, where the fields are, and just reinforce that line. And we can move it a little bit if that makes sense to do. We can add in simple hatching perhaps on these trees to just increase the feel of them as a sort of a flat object. They're a distance, they feel a bit flat, they just feel like silhouettes. And little simple marks, instead of trying to make them interesting like this, little simple marks can actually send them backwards, make them feel flatter, make them do the same job in our art as they're doing in the photo, which is filling a sort of contrast, contrast against those bright fields as a little flat silhouette. So I'm going to apply that simple hatching to all of them. Notice how I'm just trying to capture the shape that the watercolours have made. So we've got this kind of outline of colour reinforced now by the ink. These shadows we can also hatch very simply. We can invent a shadow under there. And then we can move another stage forward. And this is where we can start going, ah, oh, Toby, you really should have painted the trees. Or, no, you really like them like this. And I think both opinions are valid. And I think it would work personally, whether I'd painted the trees or leaving them like this. The advantage of leaving them like this is I can still paint them and we've got lovely space. The disadvantage is that, you know, painting them now might make them look a bit busy. It might be difficult to really get the right colours and match it with the rest of the scene. So both approaches, I think, perfectly valid. But look as we make this tree nice and bold and including the, the, uh, the tree trunk as a nice bold mark there as well. It really does stand out. It doesn't necessarily need any more than this. And what we'll do, we'll decide if we want more in the next step. When we come to our final final touches, we'll see if it wants colour, if it wants more ink, or if we're going to leave it as that really brave negative space. Um, and we'll see. It's, it's a very subjective thing, and you'll all have slightly different ideas and opinions on whether I'm totally bonkers leaving it like that, or whether I'm a genius, or something in between. Probably most of you lying somewhere in between rather than thinking I'm totally mad or a total genius. And we're gonna do the same here with these trees, just moving around. This time I've not got any um, watercolor to work with for the most part to sort of help me pick out the, the edges, but I'm just trying to create a similar feel in each of these trees getting slightly less as we go further back because the trees are one in front of the other. We want the boldest lines to be implying the closest trees. And I'm also not being super neat. These overlapping lines, having two lines telling the same story in a slightly different way, that gives the tree just a little bit more of a 3D shape, but a little bit more texture. So I don't want to be too neat. I want these lines to sort of be a bit busy. And again, hopefully you agree, they're now jumping out. We don't need to do anything else. We can do other things, of course, and you might prefer other things, but we definitely don't need to do anything else. Next step forward, we've got this little um, fence line, which I think actually adds quite a lot of structure to our scene. I think it's quite an important line to add in. One thing to note is not to bring it all the way across these flowers. The flowers are in front and actually at this point we don't want a bold line running through them but that line there delineates that shape doesn't it, it bring, gives us this real rectangle those first bits of structure that we were focusing on at the very beginning important to have a little look around just as i was talking there i realized that i hadn't touched this tree yet and it looked a bit odd as a result and we want things to look uniform so not not all the same but the same idea in each of these trees lets the viewer go ah 
these are all the same and they instantly their their visual cortex their brain tells them these are all trees without us having to sort of spoon feed them without us having to overdo it and it gives the the viewer a little bit more mental work to do which can actually make uh, make it more interesting for them to view our sketch last but not least and most excitingly and most scarily we have all of these flowers but this is where we can just go you look look at these amazing watercolor lines which have been created look at this one which has flown all the way up there flown or flowed rather flowed all the way up there maybe it has also flown and we can find them we can outline them we can use these watercolor shapes to create a more natural feeling kind of floral shape a more natural flowing shape we'll find ones which are overlapping we'll find ones we might want to leave or just provide a sort of in discontinuous line to instead of spelling the whole shape out and by doing this and finding all these different overlapping little bits of red and orange and pink we build up a feeling of these flowers in the foreground again i'm focusing all my ink on this area of interest we may even leave this let's see what happens if we just do a tiny bit there what i'll then do is take a step back do a tiny bit take a step back and you know what even that i feel pulls the eye too much so i'm probably just going to leave all of these soft pinks as suggestions and really focus my ink over here again do feel free to disagree and do it your way you might think i'm really silly not to use my ink all over here you might think i'm really silly to use so much ink over on this side and that is great that's why this kind of process is fantastic we're all understanding the same about how watercolors work. You know, they work in layers, they, they're transparent. We can use a minimal palette. And yet we'll all have a very different image. We'll all have very different ideas on what the best way to proceed in this kind of sketch is. And for me, that is gonna be my restructuring step done. It's looking actually really fun it's looking busy i've got this area of interest i haven't overdone the lines yet so i'm going to take a step away give myself a couple of minutes a little breather and then come back with fresh eyes and decide what finishing touches if any i might want to add and here we are the fun bit the scary bit the finishing touches so we mentioned a few bits we might think about and the key here was potentially the textures in the tree. And you know what? Let's see what happens if we just do a little bit more. And the key here is to do a little bit and then stop and reflect. Is that working or is it not? Well, I don't think it's harming, so let's do a little bit more. And I'm just doing little tiny textural doodly like marks. The aim here is just to delineate a little more between the the trees and how they overlap get a little bit more shadow into them because shadow in art and in photography and in all forms of vision really um, shadow is what gives something a, a sense of being 3d without shadow you've just got a flat sort of uniform object and i don't want to overdo this so even now i'm just thinking right when's it too much when's it too much do you remember I made this little silly scribble mark? I just, did you remember it? An interesting point, because I said, we probably forget about it. It probably wouldn't matter, this, this mistake, this scribble. And it was only then when I drew over it that I actually remembered it was there. So I just wanted to point that one out. Now, if you did remember it, grand, that's useful to know that you have a different um, sort of awareness of mistakes and what's important to you. For me, I'd forgotten about it. It doesn't bother me at all. And these kind of mistakes are things which are very easy to get upset about when they happen, but now can barely see it. And it just looks like one of these many, many marks which we've purposefully added in. In these flowers, I might want to add a bit of light texture mark as well. Doing a lot of repeating little marks stops it feeling like overdone stops it feeling too busy so just by 
doing the same kind of textural little marks over and over adds a bit of shadow and again it it makes everything feel the same so all these little marks are all the same and therefore our eye goes ah they're all the same thing <laughs> it's really that simple just making sure if something is the same all these flowers that well there's two different types in the actual reference but they're approximately the same thing so we're going to do them approximately the same way these trees in the distance are approximately the same so we've done them approximately the same way and the same for these trees and that just makes things really easy to view it makes them really easy to view and allows the viewer to also do their own imagination for me that is now enough ink i think any more ink i really risk overdoing it so I'm going to come in with the final, final little flourishes. Now this is going to be things like really brave bits of red, tiny touches, little lines, little splodges, little marks. They don't have to be neat. They can be little painterly brush strokes. I'm just introducing little bits more colour, a little bit more pizzazz into our image. Doing some splashes gently might also introduce some of that idea. And we can even splash that red to unify the image, just splash some red where it doesn't really belong, like up, up here. You might disagree with that. For me, it's a touch which most often works quite well. Getting a bit of the blue can do the same in the sky. A little bit more of this blue up here to make this feel full. Even though it's not, it feels more full with those in. And then I mentioned we could consider colour in the trees. And one way of cheating your way to painting is to splash in instead, to go, these are green, but I'm only gonna give you the idea. These are green, but as the painter, I'm gonna make you, the viewer, do some work. You're gonna get a few splashes of green, few splashes of yellow, and you can fill in the rest. And that, I think, for me, is one of the most fun ways to finish off painting, to imply a lot through this sort of scattergun approach to little splashes, which look random, and they have an element of randomness, but they're also carefully, carefully chosen for a certain impact or a certain emphasis or to fill a little space or to suggest or unify a theme of colour. If the red is just here, it's all a bit unbalanced. But if the red just extends out, it balances things that tiny bit better or actually not even that tiny bit better. For me, it's an enormous change in the balance of the image. So for me, it's really important. Again, feel free to, dis to disagree. <laughs> the most important step, the secret step, which you only find out if you get this far, step six is pop your signature on the work. I like to put my initials down here and I like to do something a bit silly, which is hide my actual signature somewhere in my scrawly marks. And that way, I know that I've signed it. I know my initials are there, but I know as a little secret that I've got my signature hiding up there. People often ask, you know, why do you have to sign your work? Well, look, you don't have to sign your work, but I think by popping a signature on there, you go, look, I'm happy with this. I'm proud of this. I finished this. It takes the pressure off. I can now come back and look at this tomorrow and decide if I want to add anything else. And normally, Normally, when we come back, we're a lot happier with our work, with literal space, either taking a step back, taking a few minutes, or both. You'll find yourself loving a lot more about whatever you've created today than when your nose is down on the paper staring at it. And there you go. Hopefully you have created something that you're proud of. I'm sure that you have created something wonderful. I'm sure that however difficult it was, you will have learnt something about what you like, learnt something about what you don't like, and that within your painting, within watercolours, there is always something amazing and lovely that has happened. Even when they've gone horribly wrong, or that's how it feels, there's always something to really enjoy. Thank you for sharing this class with me. You can find more of my sort of uh, teachings <laughs> um, linked in the uh, PDF handout below as well. And do find the references, paint along, and then also expand your horizons with your own paintings and keep developing your style. Thanks again for joining me and happy sketching.